next speaker, uh, a friend of ours from the American Enterprise Institute, uh, Max Eden. Uh, Max focuses on K through 12 and early childhood education reform for the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, before rejoining AEI, he was a senior fellow with the Manhattan Institute. Uh, in addition to a number of reports and studies in education, he is the co-author of the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestseller, Why Meadow Died, The People and Policies That Created the Parkland Shooter and Endanger America's Students. Uh, e, Mr. Eden has testified about school violence before Congress and about the school to prison pipeline before the US Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, he has been published in policy journals in the popular press, including a whole host of newspapers, not least of which the Washington Post, USA Today, and the Baltimore Sun. Uh, he has a Bachelor's of Arts and History from Yale University. So without further ado, Max Eden. Thank you so much. And uh, it's on the one hand, it's great to follow Elizabeth because she's great. On the other hand, she's uh, a very hard act to follow. <laughs> Um, I have assured Laura that at no point in planning for the speech or at no point in prompt you will I drop my pants. Um, but with, with, the, uh, with the obligatory joke out of the way, unfortunately, it'll also be very different in substance than her speech. Her speech was very inspirational. My speech is going to be a little bit more despair inducing, I think. Um, because the, the upshot for the topic, which is restorative justice, a failed discipline experiment, is that if you don't stand up for your child's safety, it will be sacrificed on the altar of social justice, on the altar of equity, uh, on the altar of fixing the so-called school to prison pipeline, which if you ever hear the words restorative justice, school to prison pipeline, equity and discipline, you need to kind of reach for your metaphorical guns and go to the school board, talk to the principals, talk to the teachers, because they're not putting your child first. Um, and I wanna kind of tell a little bit of, uh, you know, my story in terms of how I came to understand this, how I encountered it and how it all unfolded. So I'm a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Before that, I was a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Before that, I was a research assistant at the American Enterprise Institute. So I have been just researching and writing about education policy for my entire somewhat short career. Um, and when I switched from AEI to Manhattan, it's kind of like, okay, well, what are you going to do? You, in the policy world, you have to find a topic. You have to figure out what are the arguments, what are the merits of the arguments, are there good counter arguments? And the first thing I wanted to look at was this issue of discipline reform or restorative justice. Because while I've never been a teacher, my mom was. She you know, substituted when I was a young kid. She went to teach in Cleveland Public Schools when I got to middle school. And around 2013, 2014, a new principal came into her school, said, hey, we're doing this restorative justice stuff. Uh, we're trying to fix the school to prison pipeline. Don't send a kid to my office unless there's been a fight because we don't want to send these kids to prison. And my mom, you know, scratched her head. It didn't really make sense, tried to comply, but it didn't take long before the kids realized, hey, that's, that's what the rules are now. Um, Ms. Eden can't do anything to me unless I hit hit somebody, and if it, even if it hit somebody, Ms. Eden might get in trouble for not maintaining control of her classroom. So my mom went from teaching sixth grade to fourth grade to second grade to just saying, you know what, I'm gonna go back to substituting the suburbs. This just isn't worth it. And she was not alone. So when I kind of struck out on my own, I was like, well, that's, that's my mom's experience. That doesn't at all comport with what I am hearing and seeing in the world of policy arguments. I'm hearing, that there's this massive racial disparity that we know is primarily, if not exclusively caused by teacher racial bias. And that we know that punitive discipline, exclusionary discipline hurts kids. So what we need to do, the, the policy proposal went, was well, we need to reduce teacher discretion and shift from punitive to restorative. So instead of a kid breaks a rule, he gets in trouble, a kid breaks a rule, you do a discussion group. A kid breaks a rule, you have a nice talking to with them. And, uh, it's, it's not really an exaggeration to say that everybody in education policy was for this, was, was saying this is how we fight institutional racism. This is kind of before the critical race theory thing really came over. So I didn't know what to call it. I didn't know kind of where it came from ideologically, but I wanted to start looking into it because didn't, it didn't sound quite right to me. It didn't comport with my mom's experience. So, you know, as I dig in, and you don't have to dig in that far to realize most things that you're told by the experts about schools are based on absolutely nothing. 
um, right? So part the the argument that the disparities in discipline by race and ability status were due to teacher racism or ableism, they just fall apart when you control for stats, right? I mean, um, there is a, yes, there is a large racial disparity, but there are many other large racial disparities. There's a large racial disparity in poverty. There's large racial disparity in family structure. There's a large racial disparity in adverse childhood events, things that we always hear the, the equity crowd argue about. And you know what, it carries through to how students behave as well. Similarly with you know, kids with disabilities, it turns out once you control for factors that you can control for, the only kids with disabilities who are disciplined more often are kids who are emotionally and behaviorally disturbed which is to say kids who misbehave and are given a disability for misbehaving tend to misbehave more, which is not really evidence of uh, discrimination. It's kind of a statistical tautology that equity-minded people can't process without getting outraged about. So, you know, that was the first step. Okay, that's, that's, that's based on absolutely nothing. And um, what's actually happening when in school districts that have adopted this and nobody had really tried to collect any data. So I spent the better part of 2016 and 2017 looking for every scrap of data I could find, every academic study, every school survey, every teacher survey, and they were all bad. You know, Philadelphia banned suspensions for low level infractions, reading and math scores plummet three and five percentile points, truancy skyrockets from 25% to 50% of students. Um, some districts in California ban suspensions, math goes down by 10 percentile points. Every student survey I can find, every teacher survey I can find, the before, the after, if they ask the same questions, fewer students say they feel safe, fewer students say they feel less respected, fewer teachers say they have control of the classroom. It's just bad everywhere that I look. And I'm trying to, you know, trying to ring the doorbell somewhat naive and I'm start to get called a racist, start to get called uh, somebody who's trying to prevent an effort to promote racial equity. I'm trying to put black kids in jail, it seems. Um, but I kind of keep on arguing, keep on looking. Well, maybe, maybe I'm wrong somewhere because it's, it's rare to find something in policy where it all goes one way. Usually things just don't do anything. <laughs> the null hypothesis is what you can kind of expect to find. Um, so I kept asking and, and people would always say, well, it, it's working really well in Broward County. It's working really well in Broward County. Broward County was kind of where it all started. Um, and that's the place that's going well. It's been written about. It was the model for this federal discipline policy that I didn't quite understand yet. So, you know, you need to check out Broward County. And there wasn't really any data on it, but I kind of filed that away. Uh, and then on February 14th, 2018, uh, 14 children and three adults were murdered by a former Broward County student. And, you know, one group of students comes forward immediately and gets a lot of press. Another group of students comes forward immediately and gets no press. The group of students that got a lot of press for the group saying, this is the gun's fault. This is the NRA's fault. This is Republican's fault. Um, and they, they took off. Uh, the group of students that didn't get any attention beyond the first couple of days of, of coverage was the group that said, we knew it was him while it was happening. He, he threatened to kill us, he threatened to rape us, he threatened to rape our families, he brought bulls to school, he brought knives to school, he wore camo gear to school, he brought dead animals to school. Like we saw something, we said something, they did nothing. So, you know, I, I, I read that, I'm like, oh, I, this, is a, this is the place where we're supposed to have worked and this is a pattern that I find pretty consistently anecdotally as I talk to teachers, talk to principals, you know, it turns out when you're told, hey, reduce suspensions, reduce expulsions, reduce arrests. What they do is they just don't enforce rules or they don't document it if they do. And both can be really deeply problematic. So kind of I wrote an article just, hey, this is the fact pattern presented by these students. This fact pattern is consistent with the fact pattern that you see when this policy is implemented. Somebody needs to kind of go and look into this a little bit more. Um, you know, it being kind of our era, it got frankly a little bit prematurely picked up and run with by conservative media. You know, Ann Coulter kind of rewrote the column and titled it the School to Mass Murder Pipeline. Um, and immediately the media then reacts to, oh, this right wing allegation, there's no evidence for it, yada, yada, yada. And I realized, oh, probably nobody's ever going to look at this. Um, and that's a shame because it should matter why it happened. Um, 
and I thought nobody was going to look at it and I didn't really have any intention to do so myself. And then I got a Facebook message from a 19 year old kid from Broward County saying, hey, I'm trying to do my senior, my senior journalism project on like what enabled the shooting and I'm looking at these discipline policies, can you help me take a look? So I thought, oh, all right, sure. I, I'll talk to you about it, talk you through it, give you a little bit of guidance. And he tells me that he's organizing a, a group of friends of victims and families of victims to speak at a school board meeting to raise the questions about the discipline policies. So I kind of help guide him through some of the, the questions that he should ask as he goes around talking to people, talk him through the talking points. And, uh, you know, of course, the day of the meeting, he is told that his group is going to get three speaker spots, not seven. Uh, and you can only speak for three minutes, not the five minutes that they originally given. Uh, and after he and the other parents give the speech, and I'm watching, uh, you know, this before it really became a genre, I'm watching these school, the school board meeting unfold, and the superintendent with friends and family of kids who were murdered, who were asking questions, and as it later turned out, very legitimate questions about why this happened, said, and this is a very close quote, I just want to say I find it kind of ironic that the community is coming here to lecture us on our discipline piece, when just the other day, I got a letter from the ACLU and here's what the ACLU said. And you know, he reads a letter from the ACLU that tells him that he hasn't gone far enough in lowering detentions, lowering suspensions, lowering expulsions, lowering arrests. So that, you know, that's just that was like that was monstrous to me. Um, it's just uh, and I thought, all right, well, I have this kid who's talked to parents and talked to students. Maybe I'll I'll go down and talk to him and and see what I can find. And I do, and I meet. While I'm down there with one father, whose name is Andrew Pollock, whose daughter Meadow was one of the one of the victims, and I explain to him like what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure out what his discipline record looks like. If we can figure out what his discipline record looks like and what kids say he did when, we can have some sense as to whether or not this policy really played a role. And he's like, "All right, I'm going to be on the state school board or the state investigative committee. I'll ask about his discipline record at the next meeting, which is about two and a half months after the tragedy." So we ask, say, do we have his discipline records? The state investigators say, no, the school district have, haven't given us yet. And he says, is that normal? And the state investigator says, none, none of this is normal. So Andrew texts me and says, you know, thanks so much, Max, for your help. I can tell you're going to be a tremendous asset helping me find justice for my daughter's murder. And I was like, no, no pressure at all. Like, I, 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 I had no intent to, like, you know, go back. I, like, thought I would talk to some people, find some new facts, couldn't. Okay, I gave it a shot. Um, but I knew I had to come back and I knew I had to talk to some more people and see if I could find some more stuff. And at the next trip, I talked to enough people and found out enough stuff that I realized, oh, this is, this is exactly what it was, but it was all, and, but it was also several other things. You know, it wasn't just the discipline policies. It was also the fact that the school district will do, school districts in general will do everything they can to be inclusive and to include kids with disabilities, which for many disabilities might be the best thing. But for kids who are well known for wanting to murder their classmates and saying so on a consistent basis, for drawing pictures of murdering their classmates, for telling their special ed teachers at a specialized school that I, you know, dream of killing and being covered in blood, there's a pressure to put these kids back in public schools um, as soon as they behave well for a few months, which is what he did. And when one looks at his system record, he was only disciplined once his first full semester back. I come to realize, no, I can trace a lot of other incidents that I've been told he was in the office for. And the thing that made it different that day was that his normal assistant principal was off campus. So he was disciplined by somebody who wasn't supposed to be in charge of him. The, the most telling point in all of this was there was one point where he, you know, assaults a fellow student. He calls him the N-word. He says he's going to kill him. He throws something at him. He goes up and he attacks him. After this happens, five students, uh, four females, one male, all say, okay, we're like really worried at this point. We're going to go to the principal's office. We're going to tell them what we know. They were asked to give written statements and they said, hey, he's, he's threatened to kill us. He's brought knives to school. He's brought dead animals to school and given us some paper bags. And, like, we're really worried that something's going to happen someday. And he was given a two-day internal suspension. Uh, you look at the policies that this district had and you realize why. This is a district that 
became kind of nationally famous for fighting the school to prison pipeline by lowering arrests. They lowered arrests by about 60% over the course of a couple of years. How did they do it? Well, they basically said to kids, you get three free misdemeanors every year before you're allowed to talk to the school resource officer. Uh, in addition to that, uh, allegedly, the school resource officers were told, hey, this whole thing doesn't just apply to the enumer enumerated misdemeanors. It also applies to some felonies we're really trying to you know, work hard here. In addition to that, the school officials were also told, you know, if police want to come on campus for something that's happened off campus, don't let them on campus. <laughs> um, the policies in the district were so extreme that, and I have no reason, I don't know that this was ever used, but at least on paper, the policy was if a student had been convicted of rape or murder, uh, they could get back into a public school after 90 days at an alternative school. And, you know, the, so going back for a second, you'll remember that I said, like people were telling me before I got into this, before I started looking at this, this is the school district where it worked. And this is the school district that really did it well and the school district that it's all based off of. As it turns out, um, it kind of was one of the school districts that it was all based off of. It was touted by the Obama administration as a model for the nation. The superintendent of the school was very tight with Arne Duncan, the secretary of education. Broward was highlighted for its efforts to fight the school to prison pipeline. And it was said to be the model for this 2014 Dear Colleague letter on school discipline. And here's where things get a little bit wonky, but also really alarming. So a dear colleague letter is kind of how you change the meaning of a law without having to officially regulate it, right? Like the pen and phone thing, there's a law, it says one thing, you can kind of just say it says another thing and you're really not allowed to do that according to the law, but if you enforce the law, it doesn't really matter. So the dear colleague letter changed the way that uh, school discipline civil rights investigations were enforced from a disparate treatment paradigm to a disparate impact paradigm, right? So disparate treatment means if a black student and a white student both, you know, swear at a teacher and the black kid gets expelled and the white kid gets a detention and they're otherwise pretty similar in how they behaved up to that point, that's racial discrimination and the full force of the federal government should be able to come down on the school district if they don't make that right. And that's, that's been the law for some time. There's a lot of justice to that. Um, but the Obama administration changed that to be, well, uh, you know, it's by the numbers. So effectively, if two black kids and one white kid all swear at a teacher and are all suspended for it, then it may or may not be a civil rights violation depending on the racial composition of the school district. Basically, these investigations were opened and conducted exclusively based on the numbers. And they also weren't really investigations at all. And kind of one of the most telling cases, Oklahoma City, uh, the initial allegation was kind of what you would expect it to be. A black kid said, hey, this white kid and I did the same thing. He was punished more severely than I was. They looked into it. They found out actually, um, yes, you both did the same thing, but you were also both punished the same. And the white kid's actually Hispanic. But, but it didn't matter because the way these investigations went, any allegation of discrimination becomes a systemic investigation. And these systemic investigations were only able to end when school districts agreed to adopt the Obama administration's preferred policies, these leniency policies, trying to limit suspensions as far as possible, trying to reduce uh, you know, all kind of subjective or uh, what's it called, uh, you know, willful defiance infractions trying to make the role of the school resource officer as limited as possible. These weren't investigations at all. This was a way that the Obama administration was able to force policy changes behind the scenes while the press was like, oh, this is a non-binding guidance. It doesn't officially have force of law. And no school district could really appeal because the investigations almost never ended. But when you go kind of investigation by investigation of public records requests to like local news stories, you can just see it pop, 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 pop. But eventually it didn't, that didn't even become the big driving factor, right? The big driving factor became that reoriented the discussion around school discipline to the goal of school discipline is to reduce racial disparities. And we need to do this restorative justice thing because traditional discipline is punitive, it's exclusionary, it's inherently racist, it disproportionately affects black kids. And nobody in 
the education sphere, even after all the studies that I documented came out, even after the pieces that I've written came out, even after the Parkland shooting, I got to tell you, the DeVos people wanted to rescind this and they wanted to rescind it pretty quickly. They could not find more than two or three Republicans in Congress. They could not find almost any governors. They could almost not find any parent group to say this because the fear of being called racist was just overwhelming and stultifying. And you were like guaranteed to be called racist. Um, and you know, the, the school shooting aspect of it is, is one thing and it's an extreme thing. And on the one hand, very similar parallels to the Oxford school shooting, another kid who all the peers came to with adults and said, this is happening. Uh, according to the parents of the victims, the school administrators made a kind of a willful decision to not give him to the school resource officer when he had a gun in his backpack and they had caught, you know, journal writings about how he wanted to kill kids and there have been social media posts uh, about, you know, that he wanted to kill and they would not refer him to the school resource officer. That's, but that's still like, that's going to be rare, right? I'm not trying to fear monger and say that there are going to be 20 times as many school shootings over the next couple of years. There going to happen, they're going to be on the rise, this probably will be a factor. But above and beyond that, morals matter, rules matter. Like the entire idea behind this is based on the idea that as the Obama administration basically said, an ev like totally fair and just rules enforced in an even-handed way could be a manifestation of racism. And kids, kids will get this, right? Um, you know, white kids will get this. And I've talked to a bunch of white kids, a bunch of white teachers being like, why, why, do the, why do the black kids get away with so much more than we do now? Like there is a racial disparity, but it's, it, it's, it's the other way. And you talk to teachers and like, you know, it's become more and more difficult to like discipline a black student because he's being told by a lot around him. She's being told by a lot around him, like trying to discipline me is trying to put me into the school to prison pipeline. It is racism. That is what's going to put them in the school to prison pipeline. That is part of why there is so much kind of more stress and confusion and a breakdown of authority amongst all schools. And it's all downstream of the original diagnosis, which is, you know, that this disparity is largely the fault of teachers, largely the fault of schools. This should be kind of the, the easiest thing in the world for, for parents or teachers to stand up against, at least at a local level, at least in private conversations, right? Because you can be pretty sure that your school board member, your superintendent, your principal, they just heard this from everywhere, right? They probably haven't thought that deeply about it, but every source of authority around them is telling them this is good. Just ask them, do you really think that our teachers are that racist? And they don't, and they won't really hold to that. And you can kind of, hopefully, God willing, you can kind of break through eventually to make them realize, oh, you know, you can ask them, have you talked to teachers? You guys should also be talking to your teachers about this too. This, this could be no problem in your school. It could be a huge problem in your school. You only really find that out by talking to teachers and asking them, hey, do you feel supported by the administration? Like when you send a kid to the office, does the kid get in trouble or do you get in trouble? And if you find out that, you know, it's the teacher getting in trouble for referring to the students, then you have to talk to the other teachers, you have to talk to other parents, and you have to raise the issue and you have to run on it. And it's an issue you can run on locally and win. Um, because, you know, fortunately, thanks to, you know, the work of folks like James, work of folks like Chris Rufo, and also just, just the sheer blatantness of the ideology the past few years, people are kind of realizing that the accusation of racist is you know, disingenuous unless it's serious. And it's only serious if it's really somebody who treats somebody different based on race. It's not, doesn't have the same stopping power or doesn't need to have the same stopping power as it did five years ago. So it is something that, you know, was never really stopped and it's going to continue to be pushed by the Biden administration. They're gonna kind of formalize a rule on this in the coming months to take the Dear Colleague letter, put it back and try to put it in place so your school board members, your superintendents, they're getting an ideology that will put your child's safety second, will put kind of the moral order second, will put classroom order second from every angle. And there is really no source of argument or authority or persuasion that could possibly stand against all of that than parents. 
Um, unfortunately, there's nothing more primal than you know a group of moms, a group of dads coming to a school board meeting, coming to uh, their principal and saying, our kids don't feel safe. You're prioritizing this ideological agenda over our kids' safety. You're accusing our teachers of being racist. Just trust them. Just let them do what they think is right. Are they perfect? No. But will they be better off exercising their own judgment than trying to satisfy a spreadsheet based on an ideological misunderstanding of data that nobody really examines? Yes. So a little bit despair inducing, but I, it is something that can be fought against at the local level, I think. And about three or four minutes for questions. So I'd love to, love to take any. Yes. No, I, I honestly can't. Um, I would, I would, I would be interested in reading it, right? Because these things can go one of two ways, and it all depends on who designs them. If it's, if it's the, if it's a school resource, if it's like NASRO, or if it's like local police or state police that are designing it, they can be great. If it's these kind of Appleseed and AACP, ACLU type organizations, then they tend to be like training kids for how to not, you know, get racially attacked by a school resource officer which is you know, training a very anti-law enforcement attitude. So I, mean, I don't know, it could be very bad or very good, I, but I don't know the particulars. Yeah. Um, Allison Ship, I'm here um, from Pennsylvania. Um, my question is, we have so many parents that are asking for resource officers for asking for more safety and how the school's going about it is not really the way that we want to ensure that they're going about it. So in conjunction to the SEL movement with saying these kids need this, they've been through so much and they're fighting and bullying. What is the best way do you think they would approach it without getting more policing? more cameras, more of that. And, and if, can you speak to that? Yeah, um, there, there is a certain like, I mean, I am on balance in favor of school resource officers um, after having seen what I've seen, it's hard not to be. But you know, the, the argument that the other side makes is also reasonably compelling. Like it, we really shouldn't need to have them in schools. Um, and it would be nice if we didn't. And one thing that I've seen kind of time and time again is that, uh, you know, kids get referred to school resource officers when teachers aren't allowed to handle them responsibly, right? Like LA banned suspensions for low level infractions, arrests skyrocketed because the teachers couldn't put a hand on a student, <laughs> couldn't, you know, suspend a student. So they went straight to the school resource officer and it actually became what you know the district was accused of being so i would just try to start with teacher autonomy and teacher discretion and keep pushing on like okay well our teachers are our teachers give every tool every support that they need to make sure that you know we don't need a school resource officer to be roaming the halls to be talking to students because in a well-run school you wouldn't all right and i this is sort of related to that one, and it's almost needs to be answered on all the topics here. There's a lot of people who are running for school boards, and we talk a lot about what's bad in the policies, and those policies, since these dear colleague letters get rewritten and rewritten, where are the good model policies? So that when these folks get elected to school boards, they have something that they can take and say, this should be our policy. Where can they get those resources? No, that, that is a very good question. And uh, 
unfortunately on, on school discipline, there really isn't that. I mean, there is no like pro school discipline, nonprofit advocacy organization to the extent that there is, you're looking at it. Um, so, <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I, for this in particular, I would just, you know, go back through public records requests to what the school district's discipline policies were in 2010, 2008, 2007. Uh, the shift really started between 13 and 15. And they took things that they, they called something broken that wasn't really broken. And they put a prescription that was worse than whatever disease they were alleging in. So when it comes to school discipline, just kind of ask what the district was doing before and uh, say we should go back to basics and frame it that way.